Hello, Namaskar, 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 Namaskar. My name is Pooja Devedi. Welcome to my class, The Daily Current Affairs, where I put all the important news from the perspective of your UPSC examination in the form of preliminary questions so that you know how you must tackle the prelims questions. Other than this, whatever knowledge that you are going to gain will be important from the perspective of your mains examination as well. So, I would like to suggest that if you're appearing for the UPSC 2024, make sure that you attend this class daily. Do not worry about note making because I provide the compilation of it through my telegram channel that is by the name of Pooja Devedi UPSC. If you have any questions regarding it, you can talk to me on my Instagram as well. Alright, so let's begin with the practice question that I gave to you. These are the many events that we have to cover today. I will do it as quickly as possible but also ensure that you understand everything. So first was the practice question. Recently, China's Beidou has launched chat GPT rival for domestic use. It is called. What is it called? Many of you have answered it correctly. This rival has been launched for the use of domestic public and not in an international manner. It has been one of the biggest projects of Beidou. And because the regulations are so strong with respect to artificial intelligence in China, it was very hard for companies other than Beidou to get through it. But Beidou got through it. The correct answer from these given options is option D, Ernie Bot. All right. So, for those students who have missed the opportunity to be a part of study IQ P2I batches, in the last few months, I would suggest that do opt for the 11th September batch. That is going to be a morning batch, 8 a.m. onwards, and these will be also live classes. Live classes means that when the teacher will teach, you will be also able to intera interact with them. That means if you have any questions and if it is okay for the teacher to answer it in front of the class, that is for the collective good of all, they will do that. Other than that, you can also have your doubt sessions separately on Saturdays, all right. Other than this, you will get your study material delivered at your doorstep. Uh, no need to worry about study material, buying study material, study IQ will provide that. Other than this, prelims, test series, mains, test series, daily answer writing practice, as well as a study campus program is also there. That means if you are able to qualify UPSC 2024, your prelims, you will be called to the study IQ campus to prepare for the mains examination, where we will teach you the mains enriched topics. So that you can definitely get a good rank as well. So whatever batches you are enrolling for Hindi, English or English, you can use the code PDLive. All this is available just for Rs. 29,999. Actually, it is for 70,000. But if you use the code PDLive, you will get it for 29,999 only. Other than this, if you're also going for any other batch, CSAT, Advanced Batch, Long Term Batch, use the code PDLive for a particular discount. All right. So China's Beidou has made the Ernie bot available to the general public today. It's Beidou's answer to open AI's chat GPT. Because you know that China is very uh, constricted when it comes to using technologies other than homegrown technologies. So China also and always wants to ensure that it is getting proper domestic technology in place. That is why Ernie bot is in the similar manner launched. And of course, uh, it also makes it the first AI bot to be available to the public in China. Before that, in China, there was no such bot. So that machine learning can become more enhanced and enriched. This has been done. Beidou was one of the first companies to get the green light for it. Ernie has been touted as one of the most expensive AI projects in China, incurring cost of over 21.4 billion yuan. That is the Chinese currency. So consider the following statements with respect to quarter 1 GDP for fiscal year 24. That means from 1st April, we count our fiscal year 1st April 2023 to 31st March 2024. That is why it is fiscal year 24. On year to year basis, capital formation and private consumption expenditure have grown. Manufacturing grew at 4.7% in April to June 2023, which is lower on year to year basis. For the same quarter, the manufacturing sector's growth is skewed more towards organized sector growth. So what do we have to see? How many statements given above is or are not correct? Quarter 1 GDP for the fiscal year 2023-24 has arrived. And this was published just last evening, 31st of August. And because of certain findings, we have formulated this question because it is important to be updated and abreast about the current happenings. The NSSO has finally come up with this data. It is responsible under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. And 31st of August, it provided the data. So we have formulated a question. It has shown that on year-to-year -year basis, capital formation and private consumption expenditure have grown. 
on year to year basis no year to year basis means if we compare the data of april may june quarter 1 of fiscal year 2023 2024 with the quarter 1 of fiscal year 2022 2023 that was april may june 2022 on year to year basis capital formation that means investment in assets in our country and private consumption expenditure that means how much we are demanding for private consumption for that how much we are spending these have not grown we were doing much better last year in quarter 1 so first statement because of that is incorrect okay recently it was also found out that our gdp real gdp has grown by 7.8% what is gdp gdp is the total value of goods and services that are produced within the geographical boundaries of a country for a specified period of time this is the value of gdp manufacturing sector grew by 4.3% in april to june 2023 this is what we are talking for this current year which is lower on year to year basis for the same quarter yes it is lower manufacturing sector has not performed really good whatever growth we have registered it is because of the growth in agriculture and service sector okay so second statement is correct because it is lower then manufacturing sector growth is more skewed towards organized sector skewed means biased more growth is being registered from organized sector as compared to unorganized sector unorganized sectors are is that kind of sector that consists of gig economies that consists of unregistered institutes that are employing certain amount of people organized ones are those which are actually following the social norms of the government they have registered themselves the people are salaried and not daily wage workers so this is the difference between organized and unorganized in layman's term and organized sector in the manufacturing sector is performing better and whatever growth is there it is still skewed that means after covid 19 pandemic the unorganized sector is still suffering so these will be important when it comes to making policies for the government okay so first statement is incorrect second is correct third is correct we had to select the not correct one one only will be the correct answer india's real gdp has rose to a four quarter high of 7.8% in april to june and agriculture and services the especially the financial one this has been the major driver real estate professional services contact intensive service of trade hotel and transportation have performed good manufacturing and construction sectors they have not performed really well capital formation and private consumption expenditure capital formation means how much any government is spending to form assets that could be done from foreign governments foreign mncs private ones as well so what is that plus private consumption expenditure means how much we are spending for consuming privately that means if country like if the country like india if a country like india has demand or not so the growth rate it was for 8% and 6% respectively for this particular quarter april may june 2023 earlier it was 24.4% and 19.8% respectively so we have gone lower if we compare ourselves to the last year of the same quarter surprisingly there was also a contraction of that means decline of 0.7% in government expenditure in the first quarter that means government is not spending a lot in the first quarter april may or and june why is that it is still not very uh, you know open because of this data we just know that government spending is less if the government doesn't spend the private sector has to take care of it because in order to ensure that the economy keeps on working the government has to spend has to put money in the hands of the people by showing that they are investing in infrastructure project by providing connectivity by providing investment in some areas where you know demand can be generated so government has spent a lesser amount and the share on gdp has also decreased to 10.1% of gdp from earlier 11% exports have contracted 7.7% imports have increased by 10% i have already told you that the manufacturing sector's growth is skewed more towards organized sector's growth and india's quarterly gdp is way higher than gdp print of many other economies especially china 
service sector has been the main driver of growth. Always remember that we are doing really good in services. Five of the eight core sec key sectors registered over 5% growth in April to June for the current quarter, uh, quarter one. Two sectors recorded a higher growth rate than year ago period. This is financial, real estate and professional services. It stands at 12.2% as against 8.5% in the same quarter of the last year. Agriculture, forestry and fishing have done good 3.5% as against 2.4%. And manufacturing has grown at 4.7% in April to June 2023 as against 6.1% in April to June 2022. Mining and quarrying have also, has also declined and construction sector also has declined if we compare it to the last year. What is the prediction for the upcoming quarters? Because of El Nino, agriculture is going to be impacted for sure. Lok Sabha elections and state legislative assembly elections are coming. Specifically, we talk, talk about Lok Sabha elections. More concentration will be on spending with respect to election rallies, conducting the elections. So we can say that maybe the projects will get stalled because of that. So it will remain moderate. All right. Consider the following, increased efficiency in the administrative setup, significance of regional parties would increase, boost voter turnout, cut down the cost. How many of the given above is or are the advantage of one nation, one election? See, one nation, one elections, a committee has been formulated in order to understand it. Many people are saying, many experts are believing that in the special setting of the parliament that is going to be conducted in the mid-September, from 18th September to 22nd September, the government may be able to bring a bill in order to conduct one nation, one election. This is a special session that has been called. So many are saying that. But our committee has been formulated to understand about it by the government. So one nation, one election is an idea that will make sure simultaneously the elections of the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies happen. And that was a norm. Till 1967, one nation, one election was a norm. After certain legislative assemblies start get, started getting dissolved before completing their time period in 1968, 1969, then the Lok Sabha in 1970, this notion of one nation, one election also collapsed. Various law commissions, specifically in 1983, 1999, also suggested that we should have one nation, one election. This notion was revived again by the current ruling government. So that is why it is important for us to know about the pros and cons of it so that we can make an informed decision. So one nation, one election. Whenever elections come into practice, what do we see? That people who generally are in some other services, administrative engagements, they also get involved in the entire process of election because of duties, electoral duties. So that has a stall on the administrative efficiency. If there is one nation, one election, there is a high possibility or a probability that administrative efficiency increases because they will not be engaged continuously in one election or the other, either in Lok Sabha or the state legislative assemblies of different states. So yes, it would increase efficiency in the administrative setup. Significance of regional parties would increase. It is suggested and it is not suggested, it is predicted, projected that whenever one nation, one election would take place, the nationalist issues will gain much importance as compared to the regional issues. And the regional parties fear that because of this, they may not be able to raise regional issues. National issues will get more importance. So that is why the second is not correct. This is not one of the advantages of one nation, one election. Then boost voter turnout. That is correct. When the, the public knows that they have to participate only one time in an election for all the state assemblies and the Lok Sabha, they might turn out better because they don't have to take uh, off from their work all over and over again. Right? The third is yes. Cut down on the cost. Ah. Uh, huge amount of money is spent on conducting the elections and by different electoral parties. So it would also have an impact on cutting down the cost of it. One time cost will be incurred. So first is correct, 
third is correct fourth is correct second is not the correct answer will be one two three okay one three four that is three only here it should be three only and here it should be all four okay just beg your pardon for this all right so i hope you understood it the idea of one nation one election means holding elections simultaneously for the lok sabha as well as the various state legislative assemblies and here voting presumably also takes place around the same time this is one nation one election i have already told you about the history of it in india the positives explained it to you according to a report rupees 60000 crore was spent on the 2019 lok sabha elections this is taking into consideration both what the government has spent on election rallies and the rest of the advertisement and what the election commission has incurred on conducting the election so this is correct so increase efficiency in the administrative setup throughout the country i have already told you this as well ensure continuity in policies and programs of the central and the state government how when the elections start to take place the model code of conduct comes into the picture and because of that new projects they are stalled or prohibited to be take place why because of the model code of conduct and if it is imposed time and over again the policies of the government get a break and that is why there is no continuity so this is also one of the advantages law commission said that holding simultaneous elections will boost voter turnout because it will be more convenient for them to cast vote at once drawbacks i have already told you about the regional party one it requires constitution amendments in order to sync up various acts and legislation so that this particular process can take place even an idfc institute survey of 2015 said that 77% chance chances are there that the voters will vote for the same party for the center and different states and that will of course not be in the best interest because one party may be good for the one state and not very good for the other states it's all it is all uh, you know based on the representatives if any representative despite of their belongingness to any party is doing better for that constituency those will also get the bear the brunt of it so that shouldn't be happening which of the following has not been developed under project 17a mahendra giri hemgiri Virgiri, Tara Giri. So recently, Mahendra Giri, the guided missile frigate, has been launched in Mumbai, and this has been developed under Project Seventeen A. So, Mahendra Giri is going to be yes. Kim Giri has also been produced under this. Tara Giri has also been produced under this, but not Virgiri. Okay. So option C will be the correct answer. you have to understand that upsc will twist twist questions for you it's not going to be very straightforward it's going to twist questions and you have to know about the origin of it the myths of it and the end of it that is why it is important to follow the daily current affairs so india's latest warship mahindra giri has been launched the at mascon dock ship builders in mumbai mahindra giri is the seventh ship of the project 17a frigate The newly christened Mahindra Giri is a technologically advanced warship, and it's a frigate. That means it can carry besides it's a warship. Project Seventeen A program. Here, total of four ships have been developed by MS MDL, three MS GRSE, and these are under construction. The ships have been launched from two thousand nineteen to twenty twenty three. Seventeen A ships have been designed in house by Navy's Warship Design Bureau. Seventy-five percent of the products that are used under it are indigenous in nature, so it gives a boost to our Pinnacle Bharat as well. The first ship of Project Seventeen A is Nilgiri. It was launched on September twenty-eight, two thousand nineteen. Himgiri is the first of the three Project Seventeen A ships built at Garden Reach Shipbuilders and Engineers Limited, Kolkata. It was in. It was launched in December fourteen, twenty twenty. The third ship was Udaygiri under the project. it was launched on may 17 this year it is expected to start sea trials during the second half of 2024 then we have dunagiri it is the fourth ship of p17 a frigates it was launched in july this year and it was named after a mountain range in uttarakhand 
Mahindra Giri is also a range in Odisha. Then Tara Giri, which is named after the hill range in the Himalayas, located in Gadwal. This could also be asked to match the following. And name will be given and the mountain range situation is given. It is the fifth ship of the project 17A frigate. Then Vindhya Giri, it is also one of the ships of project 17A and it was named after a hill in Karnataka. Then project 17A ships are guided missile frigates, each of which is 149 meters long with the displacement of approximately of 6670 tons and a speed of 28 knots and these are capable of neutralizing threats in the sea. Moving on, consider the following statements. Article 85 clause 1 of the constitution empowers the president to summon each house of the parliament to meet at such time and place as he thinks fit. The summoning of the house is recommended by the cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs which is headed by the prime minister. So, which of the statements given above is or are correct? We have to see that. See, do not think that I have put this word because this word has been taken from the official dossier of the parliament. So, Article 85, Clause 1 of the Constitution empowers whom? The President. And the President gets advice from the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister gets the recommendation from the Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs. Alright. So, remember that the first statement is definitely correct. Of course, it should be a he slash she slash there. And that is why we have to be inclusive. The word should be inclusive. And 80, Article 85, Clause 1 of the Constitution empowers the President. This is correct to summon each House of the Parliament. This is in light of the recent summon that has been given for a special session of the parliament. That is why it is important for us to know. We do not have a fixed calendar. A calendar was touted to be fixed in 1955. That was accepted but never implemented. So we have three sessions generally, but this is an extra session that we have extra session that we are going to have. We have budget session, monsoon session, and winter session. On September 18, we are going to have a special session because under Article 85. Clause 1, it can be done by the president who gets the recommendation. The summoning of the house is recommended by the cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs. This is correct. Cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs is not headed by the prime minister. I have asked a question on telegram. Most of you couldn't answer it because it's a really odd thing. But ministry of defense <laughs> is the chairman of the or the head of the cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs. Okay. First statement is correct. Second is not correct. How many are correct? One only. Sorry, which of the following, which of the above mentioned statements are correct? One only will be the correct answer. I have already told you this. You have to remember that between two sessions, there should be a gap of not more than six months. So that is why we meet for three times a year. And Article 352, Clause 4 and 8, 356, Clause 3 and 366, Clause 2, Clause C. Also lay down certain times where Parliament can meet in certain situation. They have a limitation on that. Now, the President exercises the power to summon the House on the recommendation of the Prime Minister or the Cabinet. It could be either or. And here, the Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs composition is like, please keep in mind I am talking about the Cabinet Committee and not the Department. Please do not get confused about that. Minister of Defence is the Chairman. It also consists of Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution. Minister of Railways, Home Affairs, Minister of Chemical and Fertilizer and Minister of Steel, Parliamentary Affairs and Minister of Urban Development, Law and Justice, Justice Road Transport and Highway and Minister of Shipping as well. So these are the composition. This is the composition of the Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs. Consider the following statements. Statement 1 and Statement 2 have been given. We have to choose the correct answer using these many codes. Okay. So the moon orbits the earth in an ellipse that brings it closer to and farther from earth as it goes around that means whenever it is orbiting around the earth it will do so in an ellipse this is the ellipse i'm talking about supposedly this is the earth okay and whenever an ellipse is there it's not perfectly circle so moon can be certain times closer to the earth and this is known as perigee perigee point and seldom times it can be far away from the earth during its not rotation orbiting around the earth sometimes it will be far away this is apogee so 
when we have a full moon when we have a full moon as well as the distance between the earth and the moon is the minimum then we can see a super moon and the orbit plays a very big role here when a full moon appears at perigee perigee means being closer to the earth it is slightly brighter and larger than a regular full moon and that's where we get super moon so both the statements are correct and statement 1 is correctly explaining statement 2 so both the statements are correct and statement 1 is the correct explanation of statement 2 recently we saw beautiful uh, super moon and the super moon was possible because of the statements that i have already explained to you so super moon occurs when the moon's orbit is closest this is the circle of illumination half of the earth is experiencing day half of the earth is experiencing night and as we know that the moon orbits around the earth in a in an ellipse so supposedly in an ellipse when this part of the moon this is the far side of the moon this part of the moon is receiving sunlight we can see it as a full moon from the night side of the circle of illumination and similarly at the same time it is very close to the earth that is why we could see a big moon that is why a super moon super full moon the moon orbits the earth in an ellipse i have already told you about it apogee is about 405500 km that means the furthest away from the earth is this distance perigee is 363 and 300 km from the earth when a full moon appears at a perigee it is slightly brighter and larger that is why super moon which was a term which was coined in 1979 and it is also known as a perigean moon that means a moon that is closest to the earth as well as a perigean full moon all right consider the following countries democratic republic of congo angola cameroon so how many of the countries given above share a border with gabon so we have to see it with the help of the map i will show it to you but what has happened that again a coup has occurred in africa africa has become a continent of coup military coups and that is why it is important to know about it so the african union suspended gabon's membership after one day after military officers ousted president ali bongo and the takeover ends bongo family's dynasty is almost 6 decades in power what is going on that is you know also region specific and country specific that's a big thing to understand from the perspective of it but here lies gabon okay and you can see the equator is passing through it gabon shares a border with equatorial guinea cameroon congo here is democratic republic of congo and it is different from republic of congo remember that okay so what is going to be our answer angola is not there cameroon is there democratic republic of congo is not there one will be the correct answer one only will be the correct answer okay because i have already told you that republic of congo is different from the democratic republic of congo here is the drc which doesn't have a border with gabon and as you can see here is libreville which is the capital of gabon it is a coastal capital moving on this is the practice question for you and this is ha also has been a previous year question answer it correctly so that i can take your names in the upcoming segment which of the following best describe the term import cover sometimes seen in the news it is the ratio of value of imports to the gross domestic product of a country it is the total value of imports of a country in a year it is the ratio between the value of exports and that of imports between two countries and it is the number of months of imports that could be paid for by a country's international reserve all right let me take the names of those students who have answered the last question correctly many of you have answered it correctly so the correct answer is arni bot mandeep priya dr priya darshan vivek nikhil uttam shubham mallesh prabhat uh, kabilan komal abhishek Malina, Tritu Singh, Mohit, Mansi, Simran, um, Anfas, then uh, Neeraj, Dilshad, Utkal. You all have answered it correctly. Answer this question as well. Thank you so much for watching.